Hey there, and welcome back to another Miraculous Ladybug Season 4 review. And today we'll be talking about the latest episode to drop, Gabriel Agrest, which follows Gabriel's attempts to take Felix down a peg and get back the ring he stole from him the last time they saw each other, as well as pretty much reinventing Felix's character from a petty and jealous prankster to a full-on 4D chess player who for some reason really likes antagonizing his uncle. And before we get started, I think this episode was really good and gave us a lot of much needed Felix development and kind of sowed the seeds of doubt as to what his future in the show is going to entail. It just opened up a whole new realm of possible storylines and plot points, and I'm all here for that. I really love how this season's added a lot of new character development for a few more of the minor characters and started to flesh out the world apart from Adrian and Marinette. And I know that the season has been a bit hit or miss for some people, but in this respect, I think it's been an absolute win. Anyway though, with all that being said, let's jump into the episode. We start off the episode with Gabe hanging out in his creepy shrine room, talking to his wife's refrigerated corpse, telling her how he's assembled all of his allies for a big business meeting slash party at his mansion, including her sister and Felix. And so did he throw this whole thing together just to get an opportunity to get back his ring? Jesus. And once again, there's even more focus on these rings. God, they really are doing the senti monster thing, aren't they? And from here, we move on to Felix watching a little info video on the Lady Blog talking about what the Miraculouses are and how they work. Although, I need to know. Considering how little Hawk Moth and Mayura ever left the house, how does the media have such good photos of them? It doesn't make much sense, but alright. Also, Felix and his mum. Oh, they're so cute. I do love affectionate parenting in TV. So often it's broken relationships or dead parents or angst or even just emotional distance. So to see such a happy mum and son together, it's very nice. And the kissing the hand thing and then touching the cheek, that was cute. And then from one mother figure to the next, we go from Felix to Adrian, who wheels some food into Natalie's sick room and vents to her about how his father doesn't understand him and won't invite any of his actual friends to the party, while she tries to calm him down and make him feel a little better. Then she even looks really sad when Gabe turns up and orders him to leave the room. And I know she isn't the most moral person in the show and often sells him out to his dad, but she's the closest thing he has left to a mum, so it is cute when the show does touch on that a little bit. And then on the flip side, it was also funny to see just how much Gabriel relies on Natalie now that he has to plan and set up his own party. Although I do have to say, props to him for actually putting in the work to set everything up. If it was me, I'd probably just hire a party planner and hope they didn't figure out I'm secretly the world's most dangerous supervillain. Also, considering we now know you have to erase the whole universe to get your wish, I'm feeling like Emily isn't coming back after all, and we're going to get a Gabe Falls for Natalie storyline. I mean, they've had hints here and there, but now I'm looking at everything through a new lens, and I'm not really sure how to feel about it. Moving on, we then arrive at the school, where the girls of the class have roped Mark and Nathaniel into creating a perfect plan for Marinette to woo Adrian, whilst also quite bluntly revealing that literally everybody knows that Marinette has a crush on Adrian, except for Adrian. God, that's got to be so embarrassing. I got some secondhand cringe just thinking about that scenario. And then this leads into another one of those strange spin-off style things that I need to see on my screen pronto. I would watch the shit out of a show where Marinette roams the countryside of medieval France, hunting evil wizards, and trying to save a princess that looks just like Adrian. It's just so random, but so perfect as well. And this epic, glorious scene is made even better as Chloe descends from the ceiling, Mission Impossible style, and gives an evil villain monologue telling them about how she's been spying on them and is going to reveal Marinette's crust to Adrian straight away. And this whole scene was pretty funny, but it did have one big problem for me, in that it was clearly written by dudes in their 40s. Like, come on. Her first instinct was to go and show Adrian. In person? I feel like it would be way more in character for her to just send it to him, or post it publicly on social media, because honestly, it just makes more sense. It's just how the world works nowadays. Plus, posting it publicly would be way more humiliating for Adrian and Marinette, and would also probably piss off Gabe to the point where he actually does take Adrian out of school. Also, I know that Chloe's been the worst sort of person this season, but I did kind of hope that the Zoe mini-arc would close the book on Chloe as a major bad guy, and just leave her in the background where she belongs. She's kind of gotten a bit stale. It would have been much better if they just made her throw in a snide comment here and there, and then have Lila take over the antagonistic role throughout the second half of the season. This would have been a perfect storyline for her. 
I mean, seriously, where the hell has she been all this time? Isn't she meant to be a major villain? And honestly, I need to move on from this because if I have to think much more about how the writing's gone all over the place, my brain is going to melt out my ears. Anyway, Mark and Nathaniel decide that the best idea to stop Chloe is for Marinette to infiltrate the party disguised as a butler named Marino. And how does she undertake this oh-so-cunning plan? By putting on a butler's costume, slightly changing up her hairstyle, putting on an obviously fake voice, and wearing a fake moustache. And this has to be some sort of cinema-grade fake moustache, because otherwise, come on. Obviously, since this is a TV show, we all have to pretend that the characters have the IQ of a slightly below average water beetle to justify nobody just bursting out laughing and throwing Marinette into the street where she belongs. Hell, even the catering lady should have realised that this is not any employee of hers. I mean, she just walks up and gets the job. Oh yeah, the other guy's sick. What? And then Gabe doesn't even make her scan in? <sighs> and also, side note, a happier side note this time, I found it really funny to see Gabe trying so hard to get everything ready and perfect for his party. And then the episode even gave us a funny explanation as to why Natalie's so essential to him. As when he attempts to delegate to Gorilla, everything goes wrong. Also, did nobody notice the very obvious earpiece Marino has on? Gabe says no phones or other electronics to maintain privacy. But this dude walks in with an earpiece. How does nobody think to check him? And from here we get to experience some of Marinette's butler antics, as she channels her inner power of being the clumsiest person alive to attempt to destroy Chloe's phone, accidentally destroying Gabe's tablet, as well as trashing the kitchen so she can get put on childcare duty. I mean, say what you want about the creepy stalker stuff, but honestly she can act pretty cunning from time to time. Although, I guess it helps when the entire class is telling you what to do in your earpiece. They must have some money or something riding on this ship setting sail. Because I know for a fact, when I was that age, I would not put in this much work to try and wingman one of my friends. At least not to this extent. I probably wouldn't even do it now. We then get some nice family tension as Felix and his mum arrive, and Felix gets a nice look at the Peacock Miraculous, whilst Amelie shuts down any attempt to get the ring back by loudly proclaiming how generous it was to give him the ring in the first place. And honestly, it's so weird to see Gabe get outplayed by somebody. Despite many of his schemes being pretty smooth-brained if I'm being perfectly honest, he seems to often get the drop on the majority of other characters. Seeing him get played like this was an interesting change. And on top of this, I really enjoyed Felix putting Chloe in her place. One of the things the show does right is that all the villainous characters aren't just suddenly friends. They all have different attitudes and perspectives of the others that often make them clash with each other just as much as the heroes. As everybody goes their separate ways for the party, Gabe has a moment alone with Felix and interrogates him about the stolen rings. But Felix turns on the puppy dog eyes and says he only took it to make a copy to please his mother and supposedly gives Gabe back the original. But obviously, he doesn't really do that. And then Felix does the classic listening through the door maneuver as Gabe rages to Natalie that Felix obviously gave him a copy, but before Felix can hear anything else, Adrian calls him into his bedroom. And thus, Felix doesn't hear them plotting to akumatize him, and doesn't hear Gabe transform into Shadowmoth and create a Gabriel Senti monster to try and get him akumatized. And meanwhile, as all this is going on, we return to the less interesting storyline of Marinette trying to stop Chloe revealing her love for Adrian. And I get why we have this little plot thread, but I'm really just preferring the Gabe-Felix 4D chess game to be honest. And I just want more of that. I would have been very happy having an episode completely contained around Adrian's family without having Marino around. Seriously, the more I watch, the more I get pissed off by the fact that nobody can recognize Marinette with a fake mustache. It's the most obnoxious plot armor I have ever seen in this damn show. But on the bright side, I did very much enjoy the whole fandom essentially going insane over the brief glance between Felix and Kagami. I mean, I don't really have that much to say about that, but I figured you guys would probably talk about it, so I thought I'd address it. Anyway, back to the story, Chloe pretends to be a robot, and thus, so does Marinette, and she chases her into the adults dining and dancing section. And I gotta say, that dance animation was trash. I don't usually mention it, I don't usually touch on the animation, but this looked like a bad video game cutscene from like 2008. We then cut back to Felix, thankfully, and see him follow Senti Gabe into the room with Emily's painting, only to find it empty mysteriously. And this is where the scene gets really interesting. First up, where the hell did Senti Gabe even go? Is he just hiding under the desk? Freak. 
What if Felix walked over there and he just saw Gabe hiding under the chair? It'd be so ridiculous and awkward. But he doesn't, and then we see him notice the painting of his aunt and kind of get a wistful look on his face, only to be replaced by happiness as he reaches for it. So what's up with this? Is he just really happy to see a painting of his dead aunt? Or is there something more going on here? Maybe they were really close, I guess? I feel like there's got to be something below the surface here. Something that hasn't been revealed yet. And it makes it all the more confusing when the dialogue literally says he isn't close with Gabe or knows him really at all. So if he's close with his aunt, how could this possibly be the case? If there's anything that's really frustrating about this episode is that there's so much left unsaid about what everybody knows and makes you really hope there's going to be some huge payoff at some point. I really just want everything explained to me, in detail. Senti Gabe then sneaks up on him and they have a little bit of aggressive back and forth until Gabe straight up tells Felix that if he doesn't give the ring back, he can make him disappear with the snap of his fingers. Oh, and Felix accuses him of being Shadow Moth, so that's pretty huge. Big brain. And of course, with the continuous ring focus throughout the season, this moment has blown up, leading to a lot of people thinking that this proves Felix is a senti monster. And while yes, he could be, I think this is actually a red herring. I think the writers are just playing off the theory for this particular scene and this particular character. I mean, there's just so much that doesn't make sense. If he's threatening Felix and Felix believes him, they would both have to know that the Amuk is in the ring that Gabe's wearing and not the one that Felix has. So Felix essentially stole the wrong one is the idea. Also, Felix just accepts this. And if he was a senti monster, does he even know? I mean, it's possible, but that means that he wouldn't be suspicious that Gabe has Miraculouses. He would know. And then this would mean that Felix and his mother would be perfectly aware that Gabe's akumatizing numerous individuals for some reason. And honestly, they would have to know that Emily is in a coma in the basement. Or then, on the other hand, maybe Felix doesn't know the true meaning behind the threat. And maybe Gabe doesn't know which ring holds Felix as a muck. But then again, why would he even want it back so badly if it's Felix's? It shouldn't matter that the senti monster has the object unless there's another, which calls into question whether Adrian's a senti monster as well. And then we've had Gabriel try to control Adrian when Felix was leaving in his debut episode, and it doesn't work. And yet at the end of the episode, he doesn't even get the ring back, and yet in future episodes, he can still control him. So what the hell's this drama for? Was he just wrong? Does he just want it back for the sake of having it? Besides, from a meta perspective, having Felix be a senti monster's kind of boring. He's hardly appeared, so why should I even care? And then moving past this, you can also take a look at the scene's dialogue. Felix tells Gabe to transform and do his worst. Gabe then tells him he isn't Shadow Moth, but that he doesn't have to be to get rid of him. If he was actually a senti monster, well, he'd need to be Shadow Moth to make him disappear with the snap of his fingers. Or at the very least, he would have to have the Peacock Miraculous, and he would have to have personally created him, right? But with his denial, it basically brushes him off and moves away from that idea. If he was truly a senti monster, it would be far more powerful for him to actually reveal himself to Felix so he knows he's being threatened with his life. If Felix was actually a senti monster, Gabe could get him to do anything he wants with the threat of releasing him from existence if he doesn't. It just doesn't make much sense. In any case, there's obviously a lot being left unsaid in this episode regarding the family dynamics, and just a lot of holes in the logic of the idea of Felix being a senti monster, that I've pretty much come to the conclusion that he can't be. In my opinion, you should really read this interaction as, Felix, I'm a powerful businessman, and your uncle who's taller and stronger than you. You're in my house, and quite frankly, you're being a little shit, stealing from me and roaming where you shouldn't be. Your dad's dead and your family's vulnerable, and I can destroy your reputation and embarrass you and your mother with a snap of my fingers. Do you want that? And this is the point that I realized that I think they're setting Felix up to be more than just a villain. Perhaps at long last, an anti-hero joins the chat? And then he becomes one of the few people to reject an Akuma and then escapes, but not before cutting Senti Gabe's trouser leg to mark him for later. Again, this kid is smart and not letting his guard down, which just makes me really enjoy him as a character. Although then, on the flip side, this might actually be the strongest argument for him to actually be a senti monster, considering he doesn't seem to have inherited any smooth brain genes from the rest of the family. Then again, maybe that's an aggressed trait. Gabe then akumatizes his senti monster into Collector, who goes ham on the party and sucks a bunch of people into his tablet. And bad news for any of you Chloe fans that might still exist, because she openly calls herself evil here. If even the character knows they're a terrible person, no redemption arc at all seems likely. Sorry. And I gotta be honest here, it's equally kind of cringe and hilarious how much this character is so clearly hated by Asterix. 
Oh well, we can't have too much character development after all. Otherwise, people wouldn't know that there are bad people in the world. But once again, let's try to sympathise with the grown man who's ready to yeet children across Paris and possess people with magical butterflies with the inevitable intention to genocide the world just so he can see his wife again. Aww, that's cute and tragic. Not at all evil. Seriously, I know for a fact that they are going to try and force feed me a Gabriel and Natalie redemption arc at some point. And yet you're going to tell me that Chloe and probably Lila are just evil monsters that don't deserve any forgiveness ever at all? Come on now. That's a bit rough. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not a fanboy of those characters, right? But I think the double standard and hypocrisy is getting a bit, I don't know, strange. But moving on, I did find it really refreshing that people actually tried to fight back against the villains for once in their lives. Props to Kagami, Gorilla, and the head caterer. Of course, they don't last long, and the collector goes after Felix, who continues being awesome this episode, and avoids him until finally getting rescued by the heroes. And this fight scene's very brief, probably because it's a repeat villain, and they defeat him using a BS rebounding stick thrown by Cat Noir. It's really stretching my suspension of disbelief with that one. But anyway, everything works out for everybody. Shadow Moth gets his magic charm from Ladybug for him to experiment on. And obviously, he didn't expect this, but it successfully distracts him from blackmailing his nephew, so pat on the back for Ladybug. Felix gets to keep his ring and looks like the victim, which again doesn't make sense to me because he's literally just giving the copy back and it's not even the real copy. What, what's the point of this? It's the ring from the senti monster version of Gabe, so it's going to disappear when Shadow Moth releases him, isn't it? I mean, this would be proof alone to Felix that something really shady is going on. I mean, maybe he gave Senti Gabe the copy ring that Felix initially gave him off screen, but still, it's still a odd risk to take. Especially since Felix is wearing his copy of the ring. Wouldn't Adrian notice Gabriel giving him an identical ring and think, wait, what? Hey, and Marinette even luckily avoids getting embarrassed after the film producer guy deletes Chloe's files off her SIM card. And all is right in the world because I was totally, totally invested in that storyline. And moving on, of course, by getting a charm and realizing it's not in the book, Gabe and Natalie figure out that you can push the powers of the Miraculouses even further than you could before, and that the book's just what's already been discovered. So this sets up the events of Dearest Family and the Mega Akuma. God, I hate that name. Oh, and we also see them lay the seeds for further Felix-Gabe conflict as he realizes that his trousers are no longer ripped. So that means he must have been a senti monster earlier. And at this point, surely Felix is actually going to successfully steal one of these bad boys. And considering how the story's been hinting at some connection between the Peacock Miraculous, Adrian, and now Felix, I would say that that's probably going to be the one he's going to steal. And if they want to keep pushing that particular story thread forward, I think that's the best way to go. And then we finish with an end credit scene, where Gabe's leaving a trap with the supposed butterfly and Peacock Miraculouses for Felix, but you get the impression that they're probably going to be fake. So that's interesting. But why bother, dude? You denied it. Now you're going to make him think he's right? And somehow you're going to fool him. When did you grow a brain? Very 4D chess. And I can't wait to see this story continue. Anyway, that brings us to the end of the episode. And I really like this one. It was a bit slow at times and felt more like a setup for future episodes than anything else. But it was interesting to see a different side of Felix and expand on his character. Whilst also pushing the main story along and keeping up the mystery of those damn rings. Intriguing stuff. But with all that being said, those are just my opinions, and now I'd like to hear yours. What do you think of the episode? Like it? Hate it? Make sure to leave a comment and let me know.